I usually give presentations that are more left brain focused, talking about the science of fibromyalgia. I talk to patients. I talk to other doctors. That's part of what I spend my life doing is trying to teach other doctors uh, what fibromyalgia is, and I can kind of speak their language in a different way. Um, I kind of translate between the medical world and the patient world. Um, so that's kind of a left-brained experience, but for this talk, I really was forced to go into my right brain, which is a lot more uncomfortable, a lot more vulnerable, a lot more emotional and personal. Um, so this talk was actually much harder for me to prepare for than usual. Um, and so I decided to go with kind of a right brain visual approach, um, really basing my talk around one of my heroes, Frida Kahlo, who was a 20th century Mexican artist who dealt with both chronic pain and we think fibromyalgia. So I'm going to show you some pictures of her life um, and then talk a little bit about my life and kind of all of our journeys getting here. So this is a picture that Frida Kahlo painted of herself, and she, um, she wanted to go to medical school, actually. She wanted to be a doctor, and then she, her life was derailed by a horrific bus accident in her teens, and she was basically impaled by um, one of the pillars on the bus, and it broke her, broke her spine in multiple places, and she um, spent months and months and months in traction after multiple surgeries in body casts. Um, and her, her life was completely derailed. What she thought her life was going to be changed. And I think all of us sitting here in this room have experienced the same thing. I didn't expect to develop fibromyalgia in medical school. I went to medical school because I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to teach people how to be healthy. I didn't want to be sick myself. I wanted to, you know, come from a land of expertise but not have to walk through the valley of fire. But apparently, that's how you have to, to gain expertise, is to truly walk, walk through it. So what Frida did is she spent months on end um, in traction, and she decided to paint. So she taught herself how to paint, and she painted what she could see and what she could experience, which was really her own image. So she did all these series of self-portraits. And this is one of my favorites. It's um, called the Broken Column. And if you can see the little nails that she has, so that she has tears and she has nails, um, many of these nails are actually in points that we've designated as fibromyalgia tender points. So it's images like this, along with combing through her journals that have led some rheumatologists to think that, you know, retroactively they've given her a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Of course, in the 1930s and 40s when she lived, fibromyalgia did not exist as a diagnosis. But in hindsight, it looks very much like she had fibromyalgia along with significant spinal pain. I mean, she, the woman had a life of uh, intense pain. But she lived a really big, bold, beautiful life and became one of the greatest female artists of all time. From her bed, you know, essentially, she was carried to her last art gallery showing in her bed because she didn't want to miss it. Okay. So my story, I won't, I won't go into too much depth, but briefly, I was pretty healthy, went to medical school, was going to save the world, um, be a good doctor, and, uh, and then I was weightlifting because, you know, that's what you do to be healthy. And I uh, ripped a muscle in the front of my neck. Just I felt it rip. And it was really weird because I didn't know you could rip muscles there. But I injured myself before and thought I could get better from it, just like I had from other um, injuries. But it didn't get better. It just kept getting worse. And the whole front of my neck burned all the time. And it felt like my neck was, wasn't able to hold up my head. My head felt too heavy. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I saw a chiropractor, didn't know. I saw a few doctors. They didn't have any helpful guidance for me. Um, I just kept plugging along, but it kept getting worse. And then it kind of started to spread. So then my spine hurt, and my hair hurt, and my skin hurt, and my whole body hurt. And I still had no idea what was going on. And I kept going back to my doctor, and she said helpful things like, maybe it's just stress. Maybe you're depressed. Well, 
yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not causing my neck to be on fire. But I just stumbled along, and I was in medical school, so I figured, you know, I could find a good doctor that would help me. So I saw lots of different specialists, top specialists in Boston, nothing. Um, saw some naturopaths, acupuncture, so I tried it all. And nothing really helped. Nobody could tell me what was going on. And then I stumbled into a little little bit of luck. My, the chiropractor I had been seeing sold her practice to another chiropractor who came to me, pressed on these points, so these are the tender points of fibromyalgia, and I practically jumped out of my skin, and he said, you have fibromyalgia, and I was like, what? I had not heard about that in medical school at all, not on the curriculum. This was kind of before the internet age, so I had to go home and like look it up in a book. <laughs> um, and I was like, no, 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 that's not me, that is not me. And I read book after book, and I didn't want, I did not want that diagnosis. I didn't want it to be chronic. I was 26, you know, it felt like chronic illness, chronic pain, felt like a death sentence. Even though I knew it wasn't cancer, I knew it was an MS, but it felt like my life was over. So I took time off from school and I tried to figure out what I could do. So finally, I figured out nobody was going to do it for me. But what I realized was, <laughs> what I realized was, um, I was in a unique position because I was a medical student, so I had some scientific understanding. And I thought, if I couldn't figure it out, nobody could. So it was that passion and that determination that made me go back. And it was not easy. Medical school is a brutal institution in which they really, it's a very militaristic. It's not, it is not a kind, humanistic um, <laughs> healing environment. I knew I, I knew I was in trouble one day when I was I was able to go back to school, muddle my way through, and I was at uh, senior rounds with our teaching physician, and he authoritatively announced one day, fibromyalgia does not exist. Well, I'm pretty sure it does because I have it, but right then I knew that I had to be undercover. I couldn't. I wasn't. I wasn't okay to talk about it. So I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone. School. It was like my deep, dark secret. And that stigma of fibromyalgia and chronic pain. It's brutal. I think we all know. And I think people that are brave enough to tell their story, like Cynthia, I read her book yesterday. It's quite a page turner. If you've not read it, I highly. And I stayed up way too late reading it because I had to finish it. It's amazing. And she's so bold in her storytelling. And so just bears her soul. And I think it's important for us to do that. And I try really hard to bridge that gap between what um, doctors know about fibromyalgia, what patients know. And I can't speak for everyone with fibromyalgia. We all have unique experiences. Chronic pain is a unique experience. But I can definitely try and translate for doctors who might not understand. So back to this theme of my topic, which is creation. And how do you use that to help with pain? And can that help you take a vacation? Well, it can. It's hard. But when you're in the moment, when you're in the flow, like right now, I'm not experiencing pain other than the embarrassment of crying in public. <laughs> other than that, because I'm, I'm in this moment, and it's amazing. It's really exciting. So, Frida, I kind of look at her life and allow her to inspire me. And I hope she can inspire you as well. So, uh, this is a wonderful quote. There's no cure for pain, but there's balm for suffering. And that is creation. So, it doesn't necessarily mean art. Creating... A nonprofit advocacy group is creation, writing a book, telling your story, connecting, 
power of connection as creation. So this is Frida in one of her many months in traction. Um, and this is the contraption that she developed to uh, paint while in traction. And this is her um, towards the end of her life uh, when she was truly bedbound and was carried to her art gallery, final art gallery showing in bed. And this is Frida with one of her best friends. And I think what I love about this picture is it kind of shows this bond, this connection. And the reason why I bring this is I think it's so important for us to recognize that when we're around other people that can see our burden, there's healing in that. And I think um, that's what Dr. Slater said first off in her talk, and I completely agree. There's something so healing about being with people that understand and can see the invisible backpack that you're carrying and how hard it is just to get across the room. So it can be hard when you're in pain, but forcing yourself to come out to be with other people and to bask in the creation of connection is really important. Also having a pet monkey is important. <laughs> so I show this because Chronic pain has a way of sucking all the joy out of life. It can really, if you don't force it to be there, it can easily evaporate. All the joy can evaporate, but you have to force it. You have to bring it back in. And little joys can multiply and turn into bigger joys, just the same way little sufferings can multiply and turn into larger sufferings. But if you intentionally bring little joys in, and that's a piece of mindfulness practice, is doing things that you enjoy and really being in that moment, and for Frida, she was never able to have kids. Um, her life didn't turn out like she wanted, but she had this amazing house um, out, outside of Mexico City where she had a pet monkey, several dogs, goldfish, garden. She painted. She had these lovely things that brought her joy, and she did them every day. And I think we can easily forget when we're sort of in the drone of just trying to survive with pain. Life can become just sort of a survival exercise, trying to take these moments and you know, sex can be a good moment like that, but you have to grasp it. You have to go for it. Um, and I, for whatever reason, the image of her with a pet monkey on her shoulder helps me to remember that. We also have to remember that our body is not our enemy and basking in the creation of connection with our body. So this is her, she spent many months in uh, corsets, you know, body casts, and she would paint them. She would paint them, and she, she's using a mirror here, I don't know if you can see, to paint herself. Um, and so she adorned herself in these beautiful ways, and she always had these, every picture of her you see with her, this amazing hair. Um, she's always well make up and she always has beautiful uh, jewelry and outfits, and she really celebrated her own body, even though it caused her a lot of suffering at the same time. And so we can really easily turn against our body, and particularly with things like complex regional pain syndrome, I hear people talk about, you know, that's my bad hand. And I've seen the power of people kind of embracing that and saying, okay, this might be my hand that hurts, but I'm going to adorn it with beautiful things. I'm going to love it. I'm going to pay attention to it. I'm not going to call it my bad hand anymore. And this body course image really reminds me of that. Finally, there truly is some power in creation of art can be stringing words together. For me, writing is so vital to being able to share my experience. And I feel like part of what drives me forward in this battle that we call life with chronic pain is trying to write it down so that other people can understand. And so that's, for me, what drives me forward. For other people, that might be different. I was really enjoying looking at the art. I encourage you to go look at the art um, that is just perfect expressions of one woman's experience with pain. So expressing that, whatever that is for you, there is something so healing about being in that moment. And that can just be telling your story to a friend. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be formal. Um, but it can, if you're in the zone, if you're on stage, if you're painting, that's what you're thinking about, not, not the pain. So trying to find passionate things, things that inspire you and excite you, bring you outside of yourself, that's, I think, the best vacation from pain. Um, and I think what 
Cynthia and John have done with this group is they've really found something bigger than themselves. And that's what drives you forward. That's what gets you up even though you had two hours of sleep last night, right? So it can be hard to find those things. And working with a pain psychologist, they are amazing. They can be so helpful. Um, just to help you think about things differently. You know, we get stuck in a rut and we're just kind of thinking in the same way. And sometimes having someone else's input can flip it. So sometimes distraction, vacation from pain can just be changing our mindset about it, changing how we're thinking about it, and trying to kind of harness the, the power of it. And it's it's not something that I would wish on anyone. It's not something that I really wish for all of us that this was not our journey. Um, but it is. Here we are. And so trying to find within this moment, how do we seize joy? How do we bask in the power of what we can create, whether that's connection or words or um, advocacy, politics? There has to be something bigger than ourselves that we're going for. Um, so that's, for me, what has been the most helpful and what has gotten me through. And actually, um, before I come up here, I was chatting with my table mate and she asked me, how did you get through medical school with fibromyalgia and then residency? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I have no idea. But I will say that I was driven forward by passion. That's what got me through. It really was not pretty. I will say that. It was not it was not, it was a hard time. It was really hard. But I had something bigger in mind. So I would encourage you to look at your own life and figure out what is it that's bigger, that has meaning for you, that inspires you to push forward, even though you're hurting. And for me, I rely on my friend, Frida. So, I am still in pain. I am not anticipating that I won't have pain in my life, but I'm happy. So I wish for all of us that we can 